It's among the most prestigious honors in the world, the Nobel Prize. And this year, nearly a third of the awards are going to researchers in and around Boston. And my next guest is among them. He got the phone call at dawn earlier this month telling me he'd won the Nobel for Physiology or Medicine along with two others. Dr. William Kalin joins me now. He's a professor of medicine at Harvard and a researcher at the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. Doctor, congratulations. It's great to see you. Thank you very much. So when you go to bed the night before knowing that the announcement is going to be made the next morning, what are you saying to yourself? Well, my girlfriend asked, asked me, was I going to be able to sleep that night? And I said, well, you know, I think the chance of me winning is no better than 1%. So I'm certainly going to be able to go to sleep. But at 1%, I will leave my ringer on. So I did leave the ringer on my phone. And actually, I did go to sleep, and I was having a very restful sleep. And then I had a dream where I looked at the alarm clock, and the alarm clock said 545. <laughs> so that meant I had no one had that, called. No one had called. So in my dream, I'm like, I was very content with my life before. I'm going to be content with my life now, and I can get on with it and go back to my work. And then I woke up and saw it was only 2.30 in the morning. Went back to sleep, and then at 4.40 a.m., I got the real call. And what's that like? When the, I mean, what is that moment? I can't even – what is that like? Well, first of all, my, my, my heart – started racing because I think any scientist knows if you get a call that Monday morning at 4.40 a.m. Uh-huh. and it's a Stockholm number, something's about to change profoundly <laughs> yeah, in your, so. your life. And then I, I think I was barely able to listen to the, the very nice uh, gentleman at the other end of the phone telling me I had won. But I, I think I was just overcome with this sense of appreciation and what a privileged life I've, I've been able to lead. What has life been like for the last couple of weeks? You know, it's been completely crazy, and I'm embarrassed to say I wasn't prepared for how different this prize is than any of the other scientific prizes. For You know, it's obviously captured the imagination over the years, not only of the scientific community, but of non-scientists as well. So I'm not used to getting stopped on the on the tee and being asked for a selfie. <laughs> uh, and I'm, and, 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 and Plus, I, you were a Duke, one of your <laughs> alma maters, with Coach, with K, Coach honoring K honoring you at the first basketball yeah, yeah. game of the season? Yes, it's, it's, ama- it's amazing. Oh, my God. So, by the way, I'd like you to know, so we can relate better, you and I have a lot in common. I'm sure you can appreciate that. I was told by a professor in college that I was the worst student in biology he'd ever had. <laughs> and I've read, is this true that a professor of yours said, forget laboratory research, you're just not that good at it? Is no, that true? It's, it's absolutely true. And uh, for years I told people he gave me a C plus, but I actually pulled my transcript the other day and it was actually a C minus. It's not really true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not a, a made no, up story. No, it's absolutely true. So why did you, why didn't you take his advice and go become a vet or something? Well, in the short term, I actually did take his, his advice. So I went to medical school thinking I was going to be a clinician. And so for uh-huh. me, the only question was whether I was going to be in private practice or in an academic uh, clinician. But fortunately, at the Dana-Farber, I had the opportunity to one more time try laboratory research, and that changed my life. Okay, despite how bad I am in science, and my professor was right, unlike yours, <laughs> I studied up. You identified molecular events that allow cells to detect and respond to different levels of oxygen. Is that uh, correct? That is absolutely correct. I was a little nervous that, that, saying, that, uh, saying that. Could you expand on that just a little? What does that mean in English? Sure. Well, you know, oxygen, you think of it about it like Goldilocks, uh, too little oxygen and you're not going to do well, but too much oxygen, you're not going to do well either. So every cell and tissue in your body is constantly sensing how much oxygen it's getting and then will respond accordingly. So, for example, if you go to the top of Mount Everest, sure. uh, your body's going to say, we have a problem, we're not getting mm-hmm. enough oxygen, and immediately you'll start to adapt. And, and there are a number of molecular switches that, that get thrown when you're not getting enough oxygen, and we help to identify how this happens. You know, and, and I, I know enough to know that a lot of diseases, heart attacks, anemia, that sort of thing, yes. but there are tissues that are not getting enough oxygen, so that's a practical thing. But one of the beauties of what I've read about you is you were not on a mission to end up at a specific point, from what I understand. Yes. You were just doing the road less traveled or yeah. untraveled, yes. correct? Yes. Where is the money for that in science these days? Don't all these companies want to tell people like you, I need a cure for X, go find it, yes. right? Well, for, for decades, we had this understanding that the public sector, meaning largely the federal government, would fund that early, open-ended, basic uh-huh. research. And then when it was ripe for application, the private sector, you know, for example, the pharmaceutical companies, mm. would, would step in. So I think we got that right for decades. But I think you're absolutely right. The pendulum has been shifting, unfortunately, where a lot of scientists feel pressured to do 
applied work when, in fact, you can't really do applied work until you've generated the knowledge to know what, what's even possible. So, and, but now you know what is possible. And when I mention things like heart attack and yes. anemia stroke, the potential for what you and your two colleagues or two associates came up with yes. to address those issues is immense, yes? Yes, yes absolutely. And, and in what way speci specifically? Well, I, you know, I think now that we understand the oxygen sensing pathway, there are several places we can intervene with drugs to either make the, the pathway more active or less active. So already there's a new class of drugs being developed for the treatment of anemia, where you take a pill, your body does think it's at the top of Mount Everest, and you start making your own red blood cells. Conversely, we know that certain cancers co-opt this pathway for their own evil purposes, and now we have drugs that can block the pathway so we can starve them. So we can play both sides of the street, basically. And, and, and all this became possible once we had solved this puzzle of how cells sense and respond to oxygen. So you share, we should mention your two colleagues, Sir Peter Radcliffe yes. and Dr. Greg Semenza. Yes. But when I said colleagues, that may be overstating it. I had no idea. When I'm reading about you and your colleagues, yes. you didn't really work together. It's this, I read you hung out in bars yes. together. <laughs> and essentially talked about oxygen. Yes, is that, yes. Is that, well, you know, scientists that a fair, are odd creatures, so that's that the kind is, of thing they talk about That's a fair the description, bar. isn't it? Yeah, I would say we were friendly competitors. I, I think uh, you want to be pushed by people and you want to be pushed by the best. It's like any other endeavor. So I think science moves the fastest when you have people who are playing by the rules and trying to push the field forward. But I think a little bit of competition is good. And of course, you know, on occasion, uh, you find people to collaborate and help you. Uh, but in this particular case, we, I, would, I would say best described as friendly competitors. You know, one of the most beautiful parts, when I've read a number of interviews you've had, Doctor, since you were honored a couple of weeks ago, one of the most beautiful things I read in this moment of great celebration was how you said you're actually glad you didn't win this award. Yes. a couple of years ago. Could you explain to people why? Yes. So my wife was a beloved breast cancer surgeon in Boston uh, who uh, died in 2015, and she had been my partner throughout life and everything I ever did. So, uh, and, and we would joke, and she was right about most things. She actually predicted this event uh, some time ago, and we would joke about what would ever happen if, I went, if we went to Stockholm So there wasn't enough space for you? <laughs> is that what it was, though? But, I mean, is that why you said early on you couldn't have handled well, this? Well, yeah, I think, I think to have won it without her and to not be able to share this prize with her, I, th I think would have been just too devastating. Uh, but, you know, time is the great healer. I think I'm in a slightly different place now where uh, I think – to be able to share this with my children and to think that, you know, hopefully she's smiling down at me, uh, I think she would have wanted this. And the difference you're going to make in so many people's lives. It's just, it's a pleasure to meet you. Congratulations, yeah, thank you. Doctor. Thank you. Thank Thanks. you. Tell Dr. Coach K I say uh, yeah. hello <laughs> next time you see him.